I believe there is a message that, you know, there are times and seasons with God. And I believe that at the moment, God is saying something to his church, not just this church, but the church in general. And I think it's a very significant thing that he's saying. And I want to look at it this morning uh, briefly with you. You know, there are many times when God calls his people before a move of God occurs. If you look through scripture, you'll find it many times. Daniel and Jeremiah and Nehemiah and John the Baptist spent time with the Lord in the wilderness before he came out and so on. And I believe there is a, a very pertinent desire that God has for his people today. In Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 6, I want to look at this scripture with you this morning. It's a very important scripture, well known, but it's a very good one, important. <clears throat> God is laying a challenge down here. He says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him. Thank God for that. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. <clears throat> God is saying there's four actions here. Seek, call, forsake, return. <clears throat> you know, if you take the letter K off the end of that, you end up with C, S double E. And really, <clears throat> what you see determines what you will seek. A gold miner, in his mind, <clears throat> sees a great pile of gold in his hand. <clears throat> Before he goes out, that's his seeing, and that leads him to seeking. He gets his shovel and his pick and his dynamite and everything else and goes out to seek what he first sees. You know, um, an actor, in his mind, he sees his name in lights and in big banners before he takes up his trade and gets his name well known as he shows his abilities. And I believe what the Lord is saying to us this morning is to seek him about one thing in particular, and that is to see the Lord in his majestic glory and splendor. Because when we do, it changes everything. Think about Job for a moment this morning. <clears throat> Job, as you know, was a, a man who walked in integrity. He had uh, no Bible to refer to. Many theologians believe the book of Job is actually the oldest book in the Bible, although obviously Genesis talks about the beginning. But Job occurred even uh, in the history before... The, uh, the book of Genesis was written. Can you imagine what it was like on that day when Job, who had walked in integrity and sacrificed even for his children in case they had done something wrong, when he and his wife stood one day looking at a line of ten coffins of their children, the whole family was lying there, all their children, in coffins. <clears throat> Can you imagine what he felt on that day? How would you feel? His wife, you know, gets a pretty hard press, really, by many people. I have a lot of sympathy for his wife, actually. <laughs> Can you imagine, ladies, how you would feel as a mother? looking at all of your children that you had painfully born 
and watch grow up and take pride in them. And now you've not only lost your entire family, you've got no home. Your husband is sitting there on a pile of ashes, covered with boils from head to toe, lost all his money, got no home. She's got no home either now. And like some people, and I can understand it in her case really in many ways, I think she got to the point of, I don't want to live any longer. This is just too much. To go from having great possessions and a lovely family and everything in the world being beautiful in one day, just in one day, to lose everything and to be standing there looking at ten coffins of your children. And so she says to, go to poor old Job sitting there on his pile of ashes, why don't you just curse God and die? Get it over and done with. Let's get out of this. Let's finish it. And I can sympathize with her feelings in many ways. Job had a great question. Why, God? Why? Have you ever had that? Have you ever had a big why in your life? <coughs> it's powerful. I had to stand one day and <coughs> looking down at the, the coffin of my son-in-law and looking at 500 people in the church and his parents and our family and everybody I knew had one great question. Why? A young man of 27 who only loved the Lord and wanted to be a preacher. And so poor old Job is sitting there and for 38 chapters, we have misery. Many theologians believe this period of time in Job's life was about one year long. <clears throat> and they've got 38 chapters of misery. He had three friends come, and all they did was rubbish him. All they did was basically say, well, you're a hypocrite, aren't you, Job, because you put on this airs and graces and look so wonderful, but this is proving you were just a rotten, miserable sinner. Basically, that's what they were accusing him of. <coughs> His wife saying, curse God and die. Sitting on an ash heap with this massive question in his mind. Why, God, why? And then finally, after 38 chapters, God shows up. One year later. Don't you wish God had hurry sometimes? And when God turns up, Job is sitting there with this massive question of why, and all God does is talk about rain and snow and hail. He talks about stars and the Orion and Pleiades and the bear, or, um, the bear constellation. He talks about goats and donkeys and ostriches flapping their wings. He talks about lions and deers and seas and waves and tides. And it's not exactly what Job was after, is it? Why, God? What's that got to do with ostriches flapping their wings? Have you ever noticed when you're in a situation where you've got a great big question, why? That sometimes God doesn't tell you what you want to hear, why? <laughs> ever noticed that? Because you see, for God, the answer to Job's question of why was not why, but who. And that makes a great deal of difference. Because by the time, you see, it's quite an amazing thing, really. When God turns up, he doesn't tell, her, tell him at that time what we learned in chapter 1. That Job was the subject of a contest between God and Satan. 
that God had said to, uh, to Satan, look at Job, he's a man of integrity. And, jo and Satan says, oh yeah, as long as you keep being good to him, giving him all he wants and everything else, of course. And God says, okay, you can take away everything but his life. Job doesn't know any of that. And when God turns up, he doesn't say to Job, Job, you've passed the test. Ten out of ten. You've done well, my friend. I had this contest going on with Satan, and Satan said you would abandon me and turn your back on me if I took away all the good stuff, and you have proved him wrong. He doesn't tell him that. Strange, isn't it? Because that would answer his question, why wouldn't it? Instead, he talks about all the grandeur of all the things that God has done. And what we have to learn from this great thing is that God is saying that the answer to our whys is himself. To get an understanding of the greatness and the omniscience of God our Father. <clears throat> Romans 11.33 says these wonderful words, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and untraceable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counsellor or who has ever get first given to him and has to be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. It's almost like the Apostle Paul was singing that hymn that we sang a little while ago, How Great Thou Art. And when Job began to understand the greatness of God as God talks to him in this way, God actually said to Job, will you condemn me that you may be justified? God is in effect saying to him, your tiny puny human mind is so insignificantly small compared with the greatness of God that you cannot comprehend the ways of God. And only the only answer you'll ever find to your wise is to see it in the light of the greatness of God. And so in the end, Job has to say in chapter 42 and verse 5, very significant words. He said, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore I reject myself. I repent in dust and ashes. Job had come to this place where he realized there is something much bigger going on than he can comprehend. And what God is saying, I have plans and I have purposes that are so beyond your mind to comprehend that what you have to do is trust me. Trust me and ask to see the greatness of God. That is why God talked to him about, where were you when I made the constellations and flung the stars into space? Where were you when I did this and when I did that? Where were you, Job? Could you do that? Could you understand how I did that? Can you understand how I make a star? Can you understand how I make a cell? Can you understand how I make DNA? No. Such things are totally beyond our comprehension and our understanding. And Job was coming to this place where he had to realize <clears throat> there were things going on in the heavens between God and Satan that he had no comprehension of, let alone understanding of. And when you look back in life, you will find, I believe, it's true to say, 
many times the whys in our life and the questions are swept away when we see things in the light of the greatness of God. That changes everything. Changes your whole perspective. Changes our understanding. To understand that God has purposes and plans that are way, way beyond us. It's like an ant trying to comprehend the vastness of the universe. We can trust him. We can trust him. In Psalm 34 and verse 4, the psalmist said, I sought the Lord and he heard me. In Psalm 63 and 1, O oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. In a dry and a thirsty land where no water is. Psalm 27 verse 8. When you said, seek my face, my heart said, your face will I seek. You notice what God is saying to us here. Seek his face, not the things of God. So many times people say, well, I'll seek God because I need a new job. I need more money. I need healing. I need my family. I need this. I need that. I, I, I need, need, need. God is saying, that's not it. Seek my face. Seek my face. Seek him as Lord. And I believe this is a challenge that God is putting out to the church in general at this time because it's both personal and corporate. That God is calling us to a time of seeking him individually but also as a group of believers in a church because the strength of the church is just the multiplication of us as individuals. In Jeremiah 29 and 13, because there is a desperate need in the land, God says, then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. Wow. And uh, I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord. You notice what he's saying here. You will call upon me because of the desperate need that there was at that time in the land. And the need was the reason that the people of God were told by God, call upon me, seek me, seek my face, call upon me, I am listening, I'm waiting, I'm listening. Daniel <coughs> read uh, Jeremiah's prophecy of the 70 years captivity, the laying waste of Jerusalem. And so it caused him to turn to the Lord in a new way because he realized now was the time for God to move. And so in Daniel 9.3 we read, So Daniel said, I gave my face to the Lord to seek him by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. In other words, Daniel was saying, I am going to get really serious about this. This is not going to be just a five-minute session of prayer. I am going to seek God in sackcloth and ashes. Now, that is a bit tough to do. I've never worn sackcloth yet. <laughs> but I would imagine it doesn't feel very nice. It certainly does away with your image, doesn't it? But it denotes one thing, desperation. Daniel was desperate before God. And so he said, so I gave my face. He realized from the prophecy of Jeremiah, God was saying, I am going to move. There is this time period and I am going to move. So Daniel then set his face as a consequence of that to seek the Lord. Determinedly. 
And so the scripture we started with, it says, seek the Lord. It's for himself we are to seek. Not the things and the benefits. It's himself. His person. His face. His glory. His kingdom. His purposes. His will. His timing. His timing is so important. You know, many times I've seen in my own life as well, how easy it is to miss the will of God. Not because you've got the wrong direction, but because the timing is wrong. Two vital things with the will of God, direction and timing. And here we find there's an opportunity given while he may be found. God is saying, I'm calling you because I'm available to you right now. This is a time where I am going to do something unique and new. This is a day of opportunity. And when those days and times and seasons come, he lays burdens upon his people to seek him and to fast, and we need to respond to that. And I believe with all my heart that God is purposing to do something great. I believe it because of the need in the world. As you look around our world, we are faced with such great needs, locally, nationally, globally. I was reading, you know, the scientists of the world and the philosophers and the politicians, they have a midnight clock that they say midnight will be World War III when the end of the world will come basically in nuclear annihilation. And they, it used to be one minute to midnight. Now it's about 15 seconds to midnight. This world is in a mess. Society is in a mess. We don't, you, know, you don't need me to tell you that, you know. But it is Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who works in you. Listen, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Not mine, his good pleasure. And I believe this is what God is saying to us. I am calling you as a people to seek me because there's a desperate need in society, in the world, and you can either sit there and bewail and lament the situation and say how wicked it all is and huddle together in a little church and isolate yourselves, or you can do what I'm calling you to do. Seek me. Call upon me. Every revival you'll find in history basically started with a lot of prayer. In the Welsh revival in 1904, Ewan Roberts, before that great revival broke out, became... In obsessed almost with prayer. He went to a Bible college and they were, the students were in dormitories, in bunks, and the rest of the students complained about him because he was on the bunk praying all night long. They couldn't get to sleep. And he prayed and he prayed and he fasted and he prayed. And one day he said to his friend, we are going to believe God for 100,000 souls to be saved in Wales. And that revival broke out and they estimate it was somewhere around 150,000 souls got, re got saved with 1904-5. Amazing what God did. And every revival you'll find is birthed with God laying that burden upon his people to seek him and to pray. And the consequence of that was that God did a sovereign work. It is for his good pleasure, not ours, not mine. James 4.8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Psalm 73 and 28, but it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your good works. He says, call upon me in that first scripture that we started with. That speaks to me of urgency. 
God is saying, this is the time to call upon me. Joel 1.14, consecrate the fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God. Why? To have a great worship time? No. To cry out to the Lord. That was the purpose. Cry out to the Lord. Psalm 18, 6. In my distress I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple and my cry came up before him, even to his ears. Does that speak to you of desperation? It does to me. He says, while he is near, Blind Bartimaeus had that moment of opportunity as Jesus passed by and called out to him, didn't he? The woman with the hemorrhage of blood, she said, I'm going to get through. That was her moment of opportunity. <clears throat> you notice he goes on to say, let the wicked forsake his way. <clears throat> and I've noticed one thing. When you draw near to God... He convicts you of those things that are still in our lives that keep us from that close presence of God. Let the wicked forsake his way. Second Chronicles 15 and verse 4. The Spirit of God came on Azariah the son of Odid. So he went out to meet Asa and said to him, Asa and all Judah and Benjamin, hear me. The Lord is with you when you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you abandon him, he will abandon you. I believe God is saying to us, this is a time of opportunity. It's a time when God is saying, will you, my people, rise up and seek my face for the sake of your family, for the sake of your society, for the sake of the world. He says, the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. I was thinking about this. What do we think about? Right at the beginning. What do we think about? Because what you think about determines a lot, doesn't it? It determines what you will seek, what you seek after, what you long for, the pathway for your life, and many, many other things. It determines what you set your, your eyes upon. What do we think about? Deuteronomy 8, 10, 8. At the time, at that time, the Lord set apart the tribe of Levi, to carry the ark of the Lord's covenant, to stand before Yahweh to serve him and to pronounce blessings in his name as it is today. His way leads to purity and holiness. We are the equivalent of that Levi, those that carried the presence of God. And God is saying, it is time to set us apart for the ark of the presence of God, that he will lead us on to purity. Malachi 3, 2. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and the laundress soap. He will sit as a refiner and pur purify as silver. He will purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver. Why? That they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Basically, God is saying, we are the carriers of the presence of God, the church of Jesus Christ. And as such, God is going to purify us. Like it or not, he is going to purify the sons of Levi. Just like a a silversmith or a goldsmith purifies the metal. God is doing that. And he said, I will purify the sons of Levi. 
Now we are kings and priests to our God. So he will purify us. You notice in Acts chapter 2, when the church was birthed in power and glory, how God purified his people very quickly. In, in chapter 4, it says they had all things in common. That must have been an amazing scene to see people selling houses and lands in order that they could distribute amongst the whole congregation of people. And they had all things in common because love was the paramount thing, the care of the people. And in verse 30, it says, Great grace was upon them all. Oh, I'd love to have been in that crowd, wouldn't you? But then in chapter 5 and verse 1, Satan starts to come against the church. And you get the uprising of Ananias and Sapphira. And so what does God do? God has to purify his church. And they died as a consequence. If that sort of thing happened today, methinks we'd be having a lot of funerals. I don't know what you think. But then the consequence of this, it says they met daily to seek the Lord and proclaim the gospel. Then great fear came upon all the church and the community. And then through the hands of the apostles, Many signs and wonders were done among the people. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of men and women. In verse 15, it says, The sick and the possessed were healed by the shadow of Peter passing by in the street. My God has not changed. The Holy Ghost has not changed. What he did there in Acts he can do today. The refiner did his work in the church and the church became known for love and grace and honesty and power. Wouldn't you love to see that today? The church is ridiculed in so many places in the world. And no wonder Return to the Lord, he said at the end of that first scripture, like the prodigal son. Friends, I believe this is what God is really saying to his people. Because when we look around, when we hear what's going on, Jesus said men's hearts would fail them for fear in these days. And my word, as you watch the news and you see the perplexity of all the politicians of the world of what is going on, if ever there was a time that the church needs to rise up, it's today. And it doesn't come, you know, just by us having good ideas and putting on extra meetings or marching through the streets. It doesn't come through those things. It only comes when God comes down and brings his power and his conviction and his Holy Ghost moving. And he does that from time to time as you read the scriptures. You see how that happened in different times. When you read the history of the church, you see how in different times those moves of God have come. And it's come at usually at desperate, desperate times. And it's come because somebody, a group of people, usually rose up to pray and to pray and to pray and to seek God relentlessly. Not for their own benefit, it isn't about the things. It's about God. It's about getting that greater revelation of him, of his greatness, his glory, his majesty, his person. And the more that revelation occupies our minds, the more we will see God do great wonders. So many Christians have a tiny God a weak God, an insignificant God. The world sees God in that way. 
But we as people of God need that revelation that God brought to Job in those four chapters of the greatness of our God. How great is our God. How marvelous are his ways. And the more that revelation occupies your mind, your thoughts will dwell on him. And the more we seek his face, oh, the more we shall see him do wonderful things. You will call upon me and I will hear you and I will answer you. And I believe the challenge that God has for us today is to say, will you rise up? You know, recently we just had a pastor's conference and I felt the Lord gave me a word <coughs> and it was simply this, very simple, that God is calling us to come into the closet and shut the door. You know what Jesus said when you pray, go into your closet and pray to your Father in secret. When you think, think of shutting the door, basically what it's saying is you're shutting out all those things that would occupy your time and your attention. All those noises. And shut yourself in with God in the closet, in the secret place, and seek him with all of your heart, not with a prayer list to petition him of, oh, Lord, I need a new job, I need this, but to say, God, we are here to seek your face. We're here to seek your purposes. We're here to seek what you want to do and say and have follow you. We're desperate for your presence to come. We're desperate because we look around our world and they are literally going to hell. And the church is the only answer. Politicians don't have the answer because so much of what is going on is demonically driven and politicians can never work out an answer to that. The church is the only one that can rise up in the power of God and find an answer because the answer is not the church. The answer is God. It's God. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And return to the Lord. My challenge to us today, really. Will you be one of those? Will you be one of those? Will you hear what God is saying to us, I believe, today? And say, yes, Lord, I will call upon you. I will seek you. I will set my face to seek your face. I will go into the closet and shut the door. We're not talking about five minutes. We're talking about somebody that is desperate. If a mother is desperate for a dying child, she will do anything and everything for that child, won't she? It's that same kind of desperation that I believe God is looking for. Can we pray for a moment? <laughs> Father God. Oh, Father God. We long for you, Lord. We long for you. We are desperate for you. Not just for ourselves, Lord. This is far bigger than us. We look around and we, we see those that are so lost and so near to eternity. So, Lord, will you lay this burden upon us to such an extent that we cannot turn away from it? Will you lead us and guide us 
on how to seek you as you desire. Will you put that burden upon us, Lord, that we shall be satisfied with nothing else? Father God, we just lie, lay our lives before you. We want to seek your face. We want to revel in your glory. We love you today. And we are so thankful that you love us. Just while our heads are bowed, I wonder if you would like to signify to the Lord this morning. Lord, I'm going to set time aside to seriously, desperately seek you. If you will make that commitment just quietly while you sit. Everybody's praying, no one's looking. Just quietly raise your hand to the Lord, just where you sit. Just to say to him, Lord, this is me. I'm making this, this, this vow this morning. I'm going to seek you. I'm going to seek you. I'm going to seek your face as never before in my life for my church, for my neighborhood, for my family, for this nation. Father, you see our hands. And Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you will meet with your people. You said if we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. And I pray, Father, as we set that time aside and seek you in that secret place, that, Lord, your presence will fill those rooms, fill those places, wherever your people are. Draw near to them, O Lord, as you promised. Reveal your heart to us, Lord. Reveal your plans and your purposes, your timing, Lord, your direction. In the name of Jesus, we yield to you and we declare that you are Lord and God and Sovereign. And you answer all of our questions of why just by yourself. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen.